In the 1970s, I was involved with Dr. Codero's Kaka computer uh, cards that he talked about yesterday. <laughs> when we moved from mainframes and terminals to personal computers. And why do we do that? Two reasons, speed and security. You don't need to reach across the web, across this space, to get information from a shared computer. And you store your stuff on your computer. Today, speeds are so much faster, both for storage and for transmission, that a lot of people think this is no longer an issue. Uh, I think it is. And uh, especially as programs and the amount of storage that we do becomes more complex and, and larger. Uh, so I don't think that I should be faster than my computer. And as more is being stored in the cloud, I find that's happening more and more. Now, as artificial intelligence comes to pass and we become one unit, that may change. Uh, but uh, for the moment, that still can be an issue. And security continues to be a problem. We transmit so much of the, over the internet today that uh, there are more and more computer breaches. You know, I like having my own stuff on my computer with my own firewall, uh, and maybe I'm off the hacker's uh, eyesight. Maybe they won't see me, maybe they won't think about me. The cloud proponents say that they have a lot more money, they have a lot more interest in security, and uh, they're going to protect us, it's going to be fine. Uh, but um, there are also fewer targets, and it presumes that the cloud minders don't try and steal our information from us, and don't try and sell it to somebody else. So I think it still is an issue. I bring this up because, well, as you might have guessed, I don't like the cloud. Uh, but also because as we look to the future, we also have to look to the past to ensure that we don't make the same mistakes with more powerful technology. As you've heard, my name is Joseph Kowalski. I'm with the Cryonics Institute. I'm on the board of directors. I've been on the board of directors for 25 years. Cryonics is the freezing of human bodies to preserve them at the state they were in when death occurred, and then to revive them later on and repair them as needed. An ambulance to the future, as Torsten Nam had said yesterday. It's an amazing and wonderful thing to me that most of you here know this already, because just a few years ago, that was not the case. The difficulties of suspended animation through cryonics at the beginning, largely involved crystallization and damage to the cells. You know, I don't know if you've seen a magnified snowflake, but um, one of the amazing things about the snowflake is the myriad points that stick out from the flake, and that's what gives it its beauty. But those points also cause the great damage. As the crystallization happens, they break through the cell membranes, and, you know, historically, especially at the beginning of cryonics, the uh, scientists had said trying to revive a cryopreserved patient would be kind of like trying to revive hamburger. And at the beginning, that may have been true. So what did we do? We started using cryoprotectants, glycerol. We took out the blood. We, uh, and we got better. Then we discovered something called a vitrification solution, where we were able to, after taking out the blood, put this solution into the body, get it into the cells of all of the organs, and go from a liquid state to a glassy solid state, skipping the crystallization process entirely. Now, we're able to have virtually perfect cell structure, very little damage to the cells, even within the organs. There are still some problems. One problem is occasionally you have cracking of the entire item. That's not such a big problem. The bigger problem is that the vitrification solution, well, it's, it's not such a big problem because it doesn't happen very much. Um, it, it's very rare. But the, the bigger problem is the vitrification solution itself is toxic to the body. So once we try to revive the patient, we have to find a way to remove this vitrification solution before it kills the patient a second time. <laughs> that wouldn't be any good. <laughs> so that's a problem. But we're also looking to the future and to nanotechnology for damage repair of the body. And we believe that it's going to be possible to develop a vitrification solution that is non-toxic to the body. It's simply a matter of time. Um, I've been involved with cryonics since I was 13 years old. The typical paradigm, birth, school, marriage, children, move to Florida, die, it just didn't work for me. Uh, you know, there's so much to do, so much to learn, so much to be, and not enough time to do it. So uh, 
when I first became involved with cryonics, most didn't know what cryonics was. And of those that did, most thought it was crazy. Today, most think it's a reasonable possibility, though not for them. But that's a step forward. Um, the Cryonics Institute is a nonprofit corporation. The cost of whole body freezing, and no, we don't just freeze heads, the cost of whole body freezing is $28,000, not much more expensive than a typical funeral, or than an expensive funeral, I should say. We often hear that cryonics is a money-making scam. Well, if it is, we're doing it the wrong way because virtually all of us are volunteers. We don't make a penny off of this, and in fact, we put our own money into the project. So uh, I'm not sure what kind of a scam it could possibly be, but it's not working very well for me. I recently read a quote from uh, Dr. Stephen Hawking, and he said, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. Humans are good at that. We're resilient, we're malleable. What's interesting is that he didn't mention that for millennia, since we developed tools and fire, a lot of the change that we've had to adapt to is change of our own making. And that's something that I think is very important, and that's really what we're talking about here at this conference. We can't control everything, and I wouldn't want to, but we can control a lot of things. A caveat to Dr. Hawking's statement is that an important part of creating a future that we would like is to make people see it as normal. You know, many thought of those of us involved with cryonics as people of hubris, people trying to delve into the region of God. And I think of it as just the opposite. I think that we are modestly saying we do not know when death occurs. It's 1890. You're walking down the street. Somebody falls dead on the sidewalk. A doctor runs up. He's dead. You say, wait, wait, wait. I've got a defibrillator. Hold on. You know, you start shocking the body. You do CPR. You, you can try to save the person, right? He may not be dead. What happens? You get arrested for desecrating the body. They see you sending electric shocks into this corpse, kissing some dead person. They think you're crazy, and they throw you in jail. We today know the person may not be dead yet. Are there any Monty Python fans here? <laughs> we know he may not be dead yet. So we hope that in the future, someone will say to us who are cryopreserving these patients, oh, Cancer? We can fix that. That's not a big deal. You heard Dr. Cordero yesterday. We can take care of that. We can fix that. Thank you for preserving him in the state that he was so we could fix it. It's not a problem. What else do I want to talk about? I know there's something else. And we know it works. A recent article in Scientific American discussed nematodes and freezing of nematodes and the study of their memory. They have memory study of their memory, which was not changed after the defrosting process. We've seen human beings that have been underwater for 40 minutes or more without brain damage. The wood frog and the woolly bear caterpillar, and this is something I only learned about recently, they freeze solid at wintertime. Their heart stops, their lungs stop, their brain stops. And in the spring, they revive and are fully functional again. We see it happening in nature. We know it can work. We know it does work. The only thing we have to do is figure out how to copy it. There won't be any heavier than air flying machines. That's crazy. Recently, I was asked to attend a cryonicist conference for teens and 20s. No longer as a teen, now as an elder statesman, which wasn't very comfortable. Um, but it got me thinking about Robert Ettinger, the father of cryonics. He was injured in World War II. He was lying in bed for about three months, and he was thinking. He had a long time to think, and he read a lot, and he thought, you know, this, this freezing thing may be an interesting topic to come up, and by the time I need it, it's going to be here. It's going to be in full operation. Well, as the decades went on, he came to what I like to call an oh crap moment he realized it wasn't happening, and if it was going to happen, he would have to do it himself. And that happens quite a bit with things that we want to have happen in the future. Attitudes both lead and follow the future. Cryonics has become accepted for you, but not for me. But it's a step. Uh, and um, what I think we have to do is to find things that are already acceptable, fully acceptable in society. 
things which can tangentially help cryonics and which also can help society in their own right. Virtually everyone today supports organ transplants. Most know someone who has needed an organ transplant or who has donated an organ. But nearly 70% of certain organs get wasted because of the speed which is necessary to do an organ transplant. We're working on methods of resolving this. One of these methods is to create organs from scratch, make them from, from nothing. Second method is to use nutrients while we transport the organs, and this is being done successfully today with livers to some extent. And the third method is to freeze organs. So through a project unaffiliated with the Cryonics Institute, we are encouraging research into the freezing of organs for organ transplants with another goal of getting ordinary people involved. Hi, I just donated $10 toward the Cryer Prize to help make organ transplants safer, less costly, and more available to those in need. My name is Sharita. Join me, click on the link below to read more about the prize and to donate $10. And be sure to share this video with your friends and family. Thank you, Sharita. Organ transplants have been done successfully for only a handful of decades, yet we practically take them for granted. But they are difficult, expensive, and time sensitive. And though they've only been done successfully for a relatively short period of time, in many ways, the process is the same as it was when most people had rotary dial telephones. If a kidney is not transplanted within 36 hours, it dies. If a liver is not transplanted within 12 to 16 hours, it dies. Typically, lungs need to be transplanted in under eight hours, and a heart within six. That's a very short window of time. If a heart becomes available in Los Angeles at midnight and the recipient is asleep in Nevada, imagine those six hours. The difficulty of quickly assembling the necessary team of experts, transportation costs, preparing the patient. The people involved in this process are amazing and they do miraculous work. But if that window could be expanded, there would be more time to prepare the team and the patient. Transportation costs would be reduced dramatically. Safety could be enhanced, and more lives would be saved. One way to extend this time is to develop a reliable way to temporarily freeze an organ, as we now do with sperm, eggs, and embryos, and when ready, to revive the organ and implant it into the patient. The Organ Cryopreservation Prize, the Cryo Prize, was established to help make this happen. Initially planned to be $50,000, the prize will be given to the first person or group that successfully freezes and restores one of several mammalian organs to full function. Details are on the website below. The prize is administered by a federally recognized 501c3 nonprofit organization. Donations are tax deductible to the extent allowed by law. You can mail in a check, you can donate online. The bigger the prize, the more likely that this procedure will soon become a reality. With your help, the prize could grow far beyond our initial goal of fifty thousand dollars. So share, share this, with, this a with a friend and, and join us. Join us. Donate ten dollars for the cost of two large specialty cups of coffee. You can be you a, part, can of be a part of this adventure and possibly, possibly change, change the, the world. world. You could tell that's me because of the suit. <laughs> About six months ago, a year after I started this project, the United States Department of Defense allocated $60 million to this idea of freezing of organs. And I am totally thrilled by that. But what happens at that point? Longer life has already and likely will further affect relationships what we think about them, what we think about working. I'd like to be a blimp pilot, and I'd also like to be a chef. Physical changes might affect what we can do. My fingers might be uh, made better so that I could be a better guitarist. Uh, we might change our sex or our skin color. More interrelationships via brain connectivity might uh, assist us 
to feel, intuitively feel, other people's subcultures, and I hope that this is the case. We've already seen this to some extent with the relationships between the cultures via the media and via communications that have changed. But hopefully, direct contact, once we can share others' memories, things will change even more so for the better. You know, um, far more, uh, like smells, dialect and language have a great effect on us. Far more than race, skin color, or educational background. The way that we speak makes us feel certain things. If we hear people that speak the way we did when we were growing up, we feel very comfortable. If we hear people that speak differently in some different dialect, it makes us, it, it's grating, it's uncomfortable. We don't even notice it, it's subliminal. But it's very, it's, it's like a sound that you can not hear consciously, but which is grating on you. But hopefully when we connect brain to brain, we'll be able to feel what they feel, and these will change. We'll use these techniques as we typically drive a car today, or use a computer, without necessarily understanding its method. So we'll become more able to do things, but perhaps less knowledgeable about how they're done. And the question remains, if we change ourselves so much, what will that do to us? If we change ourselves into a bumblebee, how will that affect our relationship with others? We don't know. Cryonics and organ replacement are a few ways that we are working to repair physical body structures and to extend lifespan so that we can achieve more of our potential, whatever that may be. There was a physicist, a chemist, and an uh, economist stuck on an island with a can of beans. And they were hungry, and the physicist said, take a rock, you hit the can, breaks open, we'll eat the beans. The chemist says, no, no, I have a much easier way. We have a fire burning over there, we take the can, we stick it in the fire, the water will boil, the pressure will cause the can to explode, we'll eat the beans. The economist says, I have a better way still, much simpler. First, we presume that we have a can opener. I was an economist. And Econo economists create models about the future. And one of the biggest things that economists have learned is that no matter how complex those models become, we often and almost always miss something. And in general, not just in economics, prediction of the future has been notoriously difficult and frequently wrong. I know I shouldn't be saying it at this, this conference, but you know, we have to face the facts. Maybe this will change with artificial intelligence, but it won't change with my predictions. So we think it likely that in the next hundred years, maybe less, and these are things cryonicists look forward to, there will be repair of bodies, there will be changing of our physical structures, there will be interrelationships with computers, and perhaps for things like modifying the bodies so that we can colonize other planets, rather than terraforming the whole planet, we change us. Modifying our brain or, ex or extending them to external sources. But I'm not going to go into further detail because I have no clue about how these are going to happen. For example, Will artificial intelligence want to interface with us? It's a question. Elon Musk is very concerned about the unintended potential dangers of artificial intelligence. Ray Kurzweil, not so much. But both agree that the changes will be dramatic and beyond what we can contemplate. Just as today's internet was not a glint in your parents' eyes to mix metaphors. So what I'd rather discuss is how we might do these things. Nanotechnology is way up there and already in use. Machines the size of molecules can be used to manipulate and reorganize our cells. Gene therapy and manipulation is what we might think of as a more organic, biological, or chemical way of using nanotechnology. Nanomachines that we don't build from scratch, they're ones that nature has already provided us. And finally, with the help of artificial intelligence, and that keeps popping up because that's going to be a biggie, we may yet learn methods beyond what we can today fathom. Two people were talking, one said, the internet's not a super highway, as people have said, and the other one says, yes, it's a super highway, but it's nighttime, there are no street lights, and the exit signs are unmarked. What I'm hoping for with artificial intelligence is that it will help me to organize, compare, test the vast amounts of information that's out there, a lot of it bogus, and potentially do it all in my head. Changes in societal norms are already allowing us to move more quickly in this direction. We see nanotechnology in use. We see cloned animals. We see bloodless surgery, frozen sperm, eggs, embryos, targeted drug therapy, organ transplants, dialysis. And very recently, 
the huge benefit of and advances in the science of low temperature surgery. People are more apt today to raise ethical questions about these methods than to raise questions about whether these methods will work. And I think that's very important to raise those ethical questions. For example, there's a running dispute in the life extension community as to whether a copied brain, even a brain that is identically copied, is that the same person or is it a different person? I'm in the camp that says it's just a copy. But there are plenty of people that would say, no, it's exactly the same person. That is the same person. What about a transporter, like they have in science fiction? If you convert someone's particles to energy, transport it over here, reconvert it to matter, is that the same person or is that a copy? This has been done in the laboratory with very small particles, so this is not just a thought experiment. This is a serious question that we have to answer. Or not answer, as the case may be, but it's still a question. And as we physically change ourselves, and physically includes the brain, will our morals change? History indicates that roles of good and evil and everything in between have remained, no matter how much our technology, our wealth, our habitat, our knowledge has grown or changed. I was recently in Pompeii, and it amazed me, it truly amazed me, that while our technology has changed dramatically from that period, the people really have not. My wife commented that to this day, many people do not value human life. Killing is easy. Keeping people alive, more difficult. If a terrorist would come up and say, I found the cure for cancer, and what I want is whatever, this, they would get it. It's much more difficult to come up with a cure for cancer than to go out and, and shoot a bunch of people. Inside, people have not changed. But when we can change our bodies and minds, when we can decide to be a bumblebee, will that make changes? Will they be good changes or will they be bad changes? Dr. Codero and I were talking yesterday and you know, we were saying that machines, I'm not so afraid of, he's not afraid of the machines, the artificial intelligence, Human beings, on the other hand, I have some questions about. So what happens? Will that affect us intrinsically? And will there be a wealthy and powerful class that controls and manipulates a lower class? Or will easy access to knowledge create more egalitarianism? One of the premises of the Cryonics Institute is that cryonics is coming, and we had better figure it out now before the bad people do. That's also why we keep our prices so low. We want this to appeal and to be available to a cross-section of society, not just out of altruism, but because we want to ensure our own future in a society that we would consider healthy. There are always a few visionaries, and eventually their visions come to pass. Sometimes, though, the visionary is tortured in an inquisition, or uh, maybe dies a pauper like Nikola Tesla. There have been sustained changes in society's acceptance, but not enough. Cryonics has a tough time because of this. Here's an example of a circle that we need to break into to make this happen. This is something that Dr. Aubrey de Grey discussed not long ago, uh, if you're familiar with Dr. de Grey. Cryobiological society wants funding. So they go to the government, they ask for funding, the US government. And the government says, well, okay, but we're not gonna fund cryonics. And they say, no, 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 cryonics doesn't work. We're not, we don't want that, we, we want for other things. So they get their money. And then people hear, well, cryonics doesn't work. And they say, right, it won't work. So then your TV scientists, though you've all seen them on TV, the scientists that go out there, they say, oh, well, they say it doesn't work. So they tell everybody in the public, oh, the cryonics doesn't work. And the public thinks it's impossible. So they go to their senators and congressmen and they say, don't you dare fund this stuff because this stuff doesn't work. And we see that big circle going around and around and around. And we have to break into that circle. And to some extent we are but it's a slow process and that's why I think it's so important to use something like the Organ Cryopreservation Prize where we're already in the circle and to move slowly from there. We start with something that's acceptable to society and then we can hasten the process of cryonics, we can save more lives and not go through that nasty torture or pauper stuff. In the 1970s, it was predicted that we would have video phones and flying cars. Well, 50 years later, we have video phones um, so, as I said, much of what we predict does not necessarily come to pass, or at least not the way we thought it would. 
But what we do today, it happens. I drove Elisaveta crazy. I don't know if she's in here. Uh, because I didn't get her my travel reservations in time, and it was very close to the conference. She wanted to make something happen, and uh, she wanted to do it effectively, and she needed information to do so. Those of us speaking here are trying to say some things that will help you to plan for the future, and that is important. But since most people are followers, those of us who are here and others who try to do something will have more impact on what others do than we might expect especially if we can indeed lead others, which is why I focus on what we need to do today to bring about what we want tomorrow rather than uh, trying to guess what we're going to have tomorrow. What can we do? We can do organ freezing for transplants. We can do whole body freezing, cryonics. We know it works in nature. It is up to us to copy the process for human beings. Cryonics is about doing things today to try to bring about tomorrow, whatever that is. Because if we're not here, all of the projections don't matter. But in promoting and uh, developing cryonics, we are also changing the future. As we lengthen life and repair people, cryonics will be used less, but there will still be accidents, so it may continue to be used for emergency situations. If we move to a virtual existence, maybe not so much. I tend to think that there's more to us than electronics, but that's my belief and bias. Here are a few questions that people ask me. Would somebody want to come back into a world which they know no one, the technology is like magic, the language is different? Well, I have a single answer for that. Baby. <laughs> That's what babies come into. Okay, they don't know anything. They don't know any better. What about adults? I always talk about my grandmother when people ask me this. My grandmother came to the United States when she was 14 years old. She knew one person her half-brother who was here. She didn't know the language. She came from a place in Poland where she didn't have electricity. She didn't have running water. She didn't have toilets in the house. She, uh, and yet she developed and had a wonderful life. The rest of her family was killed in the Holocaust. The rest of the people she knew, everybody died. Would anybody think of saying to her, wouldn't you have rather died with everybody you knew? And yet that's what people say to cryonicists every day. Of course, as cryonics becomes more developed, there may be more people alive anyway that we know, so it might be the best of both worlds. There will be too many people. Well, people have been saying that for a long time. It hasn't happened yet. And there's more space on Earth. There will be Dyson spheres. There are more planets. What if God doesn't want us to succeed? Well, if there's a God and God doesn't want us to succeed, we're not going to succeed. <laughs> but I think that if there is a God, he gave us brains and curiosity and tools for a reason, and it would be blasphemous and heretical not to use those. He also gave us ethics and morals, most of us anyway, and we must be diligent in that area. Have there been any exciting cases? Uh, I was a lawyer for over a decade and once stopped a cremation within 20 minutes of when it was going to occur, and that gentleman is now cryopreserved at our facility. And believe me, that was an exciting case. How many people are cryopreserved? We currently have 132 people cryopreserved at our facility. Uh, approximately the same number are cryopreserved at Alcor in Arizona, and there are a handful at other places around the world. We have also about 1,500 members, and our patients and members come from all over the world. About a year ago, I had the honor to have a private meeting with Leonard Nimoy, a special man who at the end of the meeting not only donated to the cryo prize, but said that we could tell people that he had done so. Uh, so I guess it's appropriate that I close by quoting from Star Trek. In the episode Mirror, Mirror, several members of the Enterprise find themselves transported to a, an alternate universe, a barbaric alternate universe. And when they're about to come back to their own universe, Captain Kirk tries to convince the Mr. Spock of the alternate universe that he can and should work to change that society. Alternate Mr. Spock says, one man cannot summon the future. To which Captain Kirk responds, but one man can change the present. Be that person. Thank you. And thank you.